It's time to awaken your inner traveler and zip around the world as money is sent to the people who rely on it. This is Money Travels, presented by Visa. I'm Indre Viscontis. On this podcast, we talk to people who move money around different parts of the world for different reasons, and we're curious about their experiences. Sending money, it's like a very like a frequent dynamic in the Dominican Republic, especially since there's so many immigrants from there in New York. There are lots of people and families who depend only from tourism in Sri Lanka. Our main target was to get uh, guests internationally. So uh, this app is a great place. It's a war zone, so how could you transfer money there? It'd be impossible. And that's where they need the money. When I start selling, I, I joined it. an idea platform selling my products practically all over the world and I can get the money immediately. As a small business, you can be really out of pocket for days and days. And so having that reliability, you know, I can be flexible and say yes to more things. Welcome to Money Travels, presented by Visa. On this podcast, we follow the money as it zips around the world, enabling our fellow humans to survive and thrive. And we talk to the experts who are building the tools that will transform the next generation of money movement. To kick off this next season, we're taking a broad look at the landscape and global money movement and thinking about what changes the next year might bring. Where are the opportunities for growth? What kind of friction is still slowing things down? What might successful partnerships in money movement look like? And so to give us the bird's eye view, we're going to talk to Luli Perilong, Vice President at Visa Direct. She's the global head of market expansion. But first, I spoke to Devi Mohan, an influential writer, speaker, and commentator on fintech, who has been listed as a top 10 global fintech influencer. She's the co-founder and CEO of Burnmark, a fintech research company, and has helped several banks, fintech startups, innovation groups, and investors understand trends in the industry. She's also a proponent of a fintech ecosystem where established financial institutions and startups collaborate to drive innovation. Debbie, welcome to Money Travels. Thank you so much, and it's lovely to be here. On this episode, we're trying to predict the future, which, of course, is an impossible task. But what do you think is going to happen differently in money movement in the coming year or so? I think there's no prediction of the future without kind of looking at the past. <laughs> um, so if we kind of see where we were in the last couple of years, um, a lot has changed with the way money moves, uh, especially with the pandemic and um, with a lot of new people coming into online shopping. And what we are seeing now is really those habits getting embedded in our psyche and kind of um, becoming more and more normal. Using payments for your shopping has actually fundamentally changed. Um, and we're seeing it even now today um, with lots of people now only doing digital grocery shopping, especially here in the UK. Uh, grocery shopping online wasn't a very popular thing um, pre-2020, but now we find a lot of people um, have started doing that. So to answer your question on the future, I think the future kind of looks like this now, um, that we actually are going to use more of online shopping. We are using uh, more of the wallets and we are seeing a lot of QR code payments. And we will, of course, continue to use fintechs and all kinds of digital payments. One of the things I find fascinating is how human psychology can be stuck into habits and patterns and reluctant to change. And then seemingly overnight, massive changes can sweep through. And I, the way that you're describing money movement is one such change. I think for a long time, people thought cash in hand, that's going to be the way that we do a lot of our transactions, especially at places where you're interacting directly with a small business owner, like a farmer at the farmer's market. 
And then the pandemic showed us, well, actually, it is possible to use a QR code or, you know, a wallet or some other digital tool to exchange money, even in small amounts, even in these kinds of local places. Was this just a matter of, well, we had this problem during the pandemic where we didn't want to exchange something that could potentially make us sick? Uh, and so we had to come up with these other solutions? Or was there already the infrastructure in place and this has essentially speeded up something that was inevitable anyway? I think that's a very interesting point because habit formation um, by no means is easy. Um, I've seen some research where we are kind of seeing habits being formed in only about six months. Uh, so it takes about six months of a new habit before it becomes embedded in our daily routine. So if you look at the pandemic, we had about six to nine months where we only could use digital payments. And I think that certainly helped. And also, there's a, a certain group out there we tend to forget who have never used digital payments before. So it's not a habit uh, necessarily, uh, but it's that they've never tried it before. They've never used it for whatever reason. Uh, they've had family doing it for them or uh, shopping for them. Uh, so we find a lot of those people found digital payments quite easy and comfortable to use. And then we have this whole new population who have suddenly started using digital payments. And what about cross-border? So, again, I think there has been a, a sweeping change in a lot of places. Some places it's still hard to exchange money across borders. But in terms of what it used to be like, where you had a person who would physically take some cash, bring it to a you know, post office or some other kind of physical structure, give it to a person, and then, you know, a few days later that it would be received across border after a whole bunch of sort of checks and balances. How, how has cross border changed over the last couple of years? And what do you see still as some of the pain points that need to change? I think cross-border has changed so much again in the last few years, and that's not really because of the pandemic, but it's changed due to the fintech revolution and all other things happening. And one of the things, like you said, I mean, we don't take cash into shops or money transfer companies anymore. Um, we either use a bank or banking app or uh, we will use a, a fintech service uh, to make that transfer. Now, what has happened is the whole idea of money going across borders has now changed. So we are not sending money actually physically across borders anymore. And this is what fintechs have done in that they're actually moving money virtually. And that, that to me is a, is a revolutionary concept. I think because of this concept that money is virtual, you don't necessarily need to take it from place to place. Um, I think it's become faster, it's become cheaper, it's become um, cost efficient in ways we have never seen before. So definitely, I think um, that is changing. And I think in the future, one of the things I would love to see is the cost coming down further uh, because money transfer even today is uh, nowhere close to uh, the regular peer-to-peer -peer transfer or the regular domestic payments costs that we see. So this is an area I feel um, we have a lot to do. And I kind of feel the future is networks or collaboration in terms of different service providers coming together to achieve that efficiency and bring down that cost. Hey guys, this is Lakshmi Sharath here. I live in Bangalore in India, in the southern part of India. I'm essentially a traveler, storyteller, content creator. I blog. I started my blog way back in 2005. Uh, which makes me one of the oldest bloggers in India, at least. Those days, some payments still came as checks and some payments would come as online bank transfers. But I think mostly it's all become digital now. So everything is being standardized. Everything is being, you know, it's, it's not any more ad hoc and uh, payments are structured. The transactions are very simple, but they're also very transparent and very clear now. And within India, you would be surprised that even if I travel to the remotest village and I want to buy a certain craft or I want to, you know, pay um, uh, an, an auto driver. I can now pay through my wallet, even in the smallest of smallest villages today. This kind of network collaboration is exactly what Visa Direct is all about. So let's hear from Maria Luli Pairulong, Vice President at Visa Direct and Global Head of Market Expansion Solutions. Luli is a business and marketing professional with international experience in product management and business development in the payments industry. 
Welcome to Money Travels. Thanks so much for doing this. Thank you so much, Andre, for your time, for your invitation. It's a pleasure to be with you. So tell us about Visa Direct's uh, network strategy. What, what is the infrastructure like right now? And what do you provide uh, for, for these clients? So Visa Direct's infrastructure is all about, as you mentioned, the network strategy, right? What we're looking for is really to have as many connections as possible to be able to allow for payments to happen from one origination or many origination points to as many payment credentials or payment instruments as possible. Today, we are enabling um, card, account, wallet, those different types of of credentials or payment instruments, both at a domestic and cross-border level. And the idea is for us to have the broadest reach possible. So clients, when they come to us, they see our network as one of the most uh, extensive, where they have to have the least effort to set up and have the broadest access to consumers across the globe. You know, in some ways, it's kind of counterintuitive, because as somebody who lives outside that space, I just see things as getting more seamless. You know, it seems like payments are easier to make and to receive. I don't need to take cash anymore when I go to the farmer's market. Everything seems to be payable through digital. And yet, uh, it surprises me that there is this kind of real kind of growing space in terms of the kinds of services that people provide, when in the sort of end customer's view, things seem to be simplified. So can you, you know, what's what's this push and pull between kind of the, the opportunities that are out there, but the simplification of the experience for the end user? So I would say that one of the big reasons that we want to be the network of network and offer that facility to our clients is to simplify to the the user, the end user, access to money movement services. So the less cumbersome that connectivity and those even connecting tissues are for the entity who's offering the services, Mm -hmm. the faster the responses are going to be, the faster the money is going to move, uh, more scale is allowed when you have that type of infrastructure to be offered like the one that we have. And, And then that can translate into more profitable businesses or even cheaper services, more affordable services for everyone. I'm a Korean citizen studying at university in the States. So even though we have like bank accounts in the States, my parents' primary income is in Korea. And so one of the things that actually we discussed was the exchange rate. So the fact that they might, you know, they might want to send me like a hundred bucks for something, but that calculation changes each time. And sometimes we have conversations where we're like timing the date of bank transfers around the exchange rate. So on my end, it seems pretty seamless where my parents would be like, we're going to send you X amount of money today. And it arrives in my bank account same day. But from their perspective, it might be a bit different in the sense that they might be like planning several days ahead in terms of when is that money going to hit the bank account and like what is the exchange rate looking like? Seamless money movement involving multiple currencies has come a long way, but there are still some hurdles to overcome. One of the, I think, challenges in cross-border money movement is that there are differences in the fluctuations in currencies in different places. So some currencies are more stable, some are less stable, and so speed of transfer becomes a really big issue in places where there's more volatility in the currencies. Can you tell us how this volatility might be, you know, might be impacting how cross-border happens in different regions of the world. Um, And, you know, what what are the consequences of that? I think geopolitical issues will always be there. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't think anyone has found a solution where we can kind of circumvent those kind of political issues. Like I said, the best solution is to actually look at networks and groups of people coming together Uh, Because if one person is affected or one company is affected, uh, then your transfer shouldn't stop. There should be more collaboration between the actual intermittent parties or intermediaries to ensure that the money reaches a final destination. For example, with some of the wars, we have seen some countries taken off the um, correspondent banking network. The question of... um, You know, is it possible to avoid geopolitical impact on payments? 
Probably not. Um, I mean, there's a whole lot of countries who are still new to regulations around payments. Uh, for example, in Africa, their priority is not making payments efficient. Their priority is to make it digital, first of all, and then to have RTGS or real-time payments. And once all that's done, they'll start thinking of efficiencies. So you find different countries at different levels of maturity in terms of digital payments. And I think um, that's that can't be avoided. And I think that the future will be everyone actually working together to solve uh, the cross-border issue. Are there some upcoming regulations, uh, as you mentioned, in India or China or another country that you feel are going to make a really big difference, a real change in how money moves either within that country or across its borders? I think there are a lot of regulations coming up around the world, in fact. I mean, um, Europe is very good at announcing regulations in advance. China and India are not, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, so in Europe, we see a lot of focus on payments regulations now. We have had UK separate from the EU framework of payments um, after Brexit. So the UK is now creating its own digital payments framework. And it's always country dependent because the kind of cashless level every country wants to achieve is um, determined by the country. And the UK will never be 100% cashless based on what they have announced. And we will see something like 80% as the maximum we will achieve here. But in Europe, uh, Sweden, for example, is 100% cashless and the regulations support that. Um, so I think that is what's important to kind of understand. And each country has a different approach to digital payments in order to support the level of cashlessness they want in a society. Um, and in India, I think, again, um, the story and the split between the urban and the rural population is quite high, not so much in China, but still a major issue to digital payments. So the focus of these two countries will be bringing the rural population and smaller levels of much cheaper payments uh, coming on to the system. Um, and they have both issued apps, and the Indian app is a free government-based app, and in China we have two very large apps. And all of these are actually bringing a high amount of scale and volume into the payments ecosystem. And I think the next few years will focus on bringing inclusion in terms of the rural population, in terms of the aged population, in terms of women and the young population, etc., you know, money is, as you mentioned, really influenced by the geopolitics of the locale in which it is originating. And there, yet there are these global networks, Visa being one of them. I wonder if you could speculate as to, in those places that you mentioned where they're just kind of getting started in terms of digitizing money and and exchanging, you know, moving money, what are the biggest benefits that a network like Visa could provide for that country, whether it's startup fintechs in that country or the governments themselves? I think a large company uh, or organization like Visa can actually bring a lot of value um, to that kind of environment where they are just beginning to digitize. And I think it's so important to take lessons of more mature countries in terms of payments regulation, in terms of the frameworks, in terms of actually building that network of countries I'm talking about. And Visa is actually sitting on it. I mean, they're sitting on a network already. And and they have the know-how and the industry knowledge needed to go, for example, RTGS or any, any kind of international money transfer um, mechanism. So I think there is a lot of scope there uh, for bringing countries together and also to bring banks together to make this more efficient. Um, so I think that is exactly what I would say for the future. Collaboration is absolutely key. My name is uh, Ed Cantia. I'm the general manager of Cooperative Copies. We're uh, a coffee importer owned by collectively by 23 roasters around the U.S. and Canada. And we import fair trade and organic coffee on behalf of our membership from around about 40 producer groups around the world. Geopolitically, these are not the safest places in the world. I, I think the concept of a digital wallet could solve a lot of these security issues with producer. And uh, something I refer to as seller's remorse. A lot of coffee producers live in abject poverty. 
and you can't fault them for it. They're going to take the money they can get that day because they have to go feed their kids. If a producer sells on one day, but but the price is say a dollar eighty in the market, and then and then they don't get paid until the end of the week, and the market moved to two twenty, they're not happy. So there's something to be said about paying them the moment you get the coffee. And digital wallets does seem like it would be a great way. Of course, this has happened in Colombia. Colombia is one of those countries that has some security issues. I'm walking around、uh, a countryside with cash. But what surprises me is it's not as mainstream as you'd think. Collaboration is a key part of improving interoperability and access. So, getting payments processed nearly instantly helps people who are counting on that money. And of course. They also can't afford to pay premium prices for money exchange. They need fast, efficient, and cost-effective money movement. Tell us about or explain the the importance of interoperability and 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 why that is something that Visa Direct、uh, is is really centering upon. So, as you know, our services we offer connectivity that allow you to send money to card. We also have. The ability to send money to bank accounts, and we now have the ability to send money to to wallets as well, cross border. I think that is one collective big hit that Visa Direct has had, and that is adding a lot of value to our clients. Some of the assets that we have that will promote interoperability domestically, one of them is Visa Plus. So Visa Plus is a service where we. We connect wallets. So if you are on one app and I am in a different app, and you want to send money to me, those apps would leverage the Visa Plus service to interconnect and make the experience seamless for the user. And being that one-stop shop where you can come and connect and have access to more than 190 countries or, or territories, acts and unlock more than 65 use cases, have access to more than 8.5 billion endpoints. That is huge. And what about the issue of access? We know that obviously there are a lot of inequalities across the globe. How do you how do you see Visa Direct's role in terms of giving access to money movement、uh, to people and places where traditionally that has not been something that's been easy? So that is an aspect of our business, Indra, that excites me the most. To be very honest, so I love that you're asking this question. Thank you for that. When we talk about the fragmentation of the market, remember we mentioned that there are several different types of players that are coming to the market. Several. Different types of businesses that are thinking of how can we give more access to more people? How can we accelerate the financial inclusion in a market where it's cash dominant or very informal dominant in terms of the, how the economy is operating? And the beauty of Visa Direct and the philosophy that we have, not only of being a network from an infrastructure standpoint, but also having the ability to partner with all of these different. Types of players is really to support the growth of that axis. So we,、um, what we look forward to as super apps come in, fintechs come into the market. We see financial institutions offering services and differentiating their approach as well. We have enablers, we have issuers, we have acquirers, we have so many players that are looking for. Um, the the growth and maybe the more sophistication on how can we bring financial services in an easier way, transparent of course, following all the regulations, but making sure that people have that power, they have access to those instruments, and it's not only a benefit or a privilege of a few; it's something that everybody can have access. That is what I think is the beauty and the excitement of the space that we're in today, because with that. Diversification of players in the payment space that will allow us to have an impact that is much broader than it would be if we were only speaking or connecting to particular types of players. Great. That is really where we can reach a global impact, and that is what Visa can do because we already have global infrastructure. So we want to make sure that that continues to grow in a way that it serves those different types of players. And in the end, the result is exactly what you're saying: it's more access to more people. And are there any obstacles that you have seen or that you worry about in terms of making that interoperability more seamless,、um, more available to your partners? For example, are there governments that stand in the way? What are the pain points? So I see one 
one or two aspects there related to governments, of course. But one one challenge that we need to look into and, and be very cautious about in, in terms of standardizing the messaging and the, the, the data of transactions is around compliance to everything that is related to, you know, know your customer AML. So we want to have a platform that is absolutely uh, reliable and that offers the greatest transaction confidence as possible. And in order to do that, when you're operating across the globe, you have to be very mindful about what are those data requirements. And the data requirements plus the standardization on how to capture that data in the messaging standards that we operate are aspects that in many cases are defined by government because they come from the regulations that exist either global or regional or locally. So I would say that it is it is a challenge because across the globe, every government is always updating their regulation and we have to keep up and keep uh, you know, be, make sure that our network is offering services that will allow our clients to comply with that regulation and ensure that the transaction is secure across the board. So what are the trends we can expect or look for in the coming year? For a long time, of course, your identity, proving who you were, was often tied to the government-issued IDs. And now, as our identity becomes more and more digital in everyday situations, it can be more tied to our own biometrics, a fingerprint or a password uh, that, that we create, etc., what do you see as the impact of this digitization of our identity for money movement, um, you know, in general? And, and you know, do you see some trends coming in the next year that, that people should be thinking about? I think it's a, it's a huge, huge part of the payment revolution that we're going to see in the next 10 years, because the kind of data we have from the identity programs um, happening around the world is absolutely fantastic to make payments cheaper and more efficient, like I said before, and also to add more to the customers. I mean, we do KYC every time we open a new bank account. We do a KYC every time we open a new account, maybe with the same bank. And those kind of things should not be happening anymore. And the same with payments. I mean, they ask the same kind of questions the moment we initiate a payments transaction, whether it's domestic or international. So the understanding of the customers is absolutely key to make things easier and better for the customers. And understanding them comes from the basic understanding of digital identity and also with behavior tracking. I think those two are very closely tied together because you have the basics of understanding a customer with uh, identity, but it's so important to add on new data to it. Uh, it could be your social media data, it could be your phone data, or it could be your behavior patterns. But I think that is so crucial. And we see a lot of examples, for example, in Canada, where they have actually brought all this together in one ecosystem. And payments is so smooth because uh, we kind of um, have digital identity in the same platform as the banks, as well as the government services, as well as the utilities. It's all in the same platform. And the benefits to the customers is tremendous. Um, and I think Estonia, for example, in Europe is trying that, Belgium as well. So there are a lot of new countries actually using the identity program uh, for better services. And I think that, again, is a powerful thing for the future. And I also believe that the future may not necessarily be about downloading a new app or getting your banking app. It would be as simple as saying, maybe to your phone, can you please send some money to my best friend? Because they already know who your best friend is. You don't need to qualify that. Um, and how much owed to them is probably known uh, based on the bills and the patterns that you have exhibited. And the, the information is all out there. It's just a matter of bringing it all together and uh, in order to give the best service possible. It sounds scary a little, but <laughs> in terms of the amount of data actually being used on you, but it's out there. It's just a matter of bringing it all together. 
I think we have talked quite a lot about uh, the, the scary parts of digital payments, but I think it's a great step to the future in terms of having more convenience and a better customer experience for all of us. So I think the investment is absolutely key. And again, one of the things we didn't talk about is kind of embedded finance and where all of these players come together to provide services. And I think that's, again, a huge, huge topic for the next year where a lot of players are now partnering with each other uh, to actually make payments happen, uh, but um, getting their own value from the whole network that they're creating. So we, we will see a lot of interesting changes in the next year is what I'm hoping. And what about the future of Visa Direct? The B two B use cases in general uh, are are coming are, are a fast follow from what we see around P two P, for example, mm. in remitters. Right. Mm -hmm. Naturally, we know that th they don't have the same immediacy as, for example, right now as we talk about you know, be being consumers, we want everything right now, or I need to send money to my family back home. They need that money; it's immediate. So I think that the growth of those B two B payments coming into uh, this space and really picking up and being adopted widely. So all of the businesses as well, either small or big, can also leverage the benefits of everything that is real time is a huge, huge opportunity that we're seeing ahead of us mm -hmm. and that we expect a massive growth there. Thanks for listening to this episode of Money Travels. And thanks again to Debbie Mohan and Maria Luli Peyrelong for helping us look into the future of money movement and setting us up for a brand new season. If you've enjoyed this episode, please subscribe so you don't miss an episode or follow the show and leave us a review so that other people can find it too. Until next time, I'm Indre Viscontis and this has been Money Travels presented by Visa.